Hello to you friends, welcome. This is Dhamma on Air number 14 and there are eight questions. They fall in three groups. Uh, first are on the mental hindrances, which is good to know about because that's what keeps us back from Nibbana. Then there's something about stream entry, which is also good to know because that's a goal of the Buddhist practice, both for the monk and the ordained uh, and for lay people because it makes safe. And then there's some in the end, there's a little bit about the, the superhuman powers, the happiness. But first, a normal intro. Namo Tasso Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Worthy, honorable, and perfectly self enlightened was Siblis Buddha. The first question goes as this, are the five hindrances caused by having a physical body? And the short answer is no, but some are connected with having a physical body. Because if you have a physical body, then you have senses. If you have senses, then you can get sense desire. Sense desire is the first hindrances. So the five mental hindrances Ah, what? There's a mental hindrance of desire for sensing something, for seeing something, for hearing something, for smelling something, for tasting something, for touching something, and for having special mental states or ideas, like being happy, like being glad, like being intoxicated, like having a mental absorption, a jhana absorption, for example. This is the first hindrance, sense desire. The second hindrance is, is called karma chanda. Karma, sense desire. Uh, uh, karma, uh, you can say, sensing. Uh, chanda desire. The second is, kind of say, the mirror image, the opposite of sense desire, which is aversion and ill will. Vyapada. Then there's a uh, mental hindrance of litaki and laziness is the third, or sloth and torpor. And then there's uh, the hindrance of doubt and uncertainty. First of all, skeptical doubt in the Buddhist enlightenment. And then there's restlessness and regret. Restlessness and regret is number four, and doubt and uncertainty is number five. So these are the five hindrances that keeps us back from Nibbana and keep us back from being noble. And from where do they come and when do they cease? Uh, let's say we start with where do they cease, actually? At what state do they cease? Yeah, doubt and uncertainty, skeptical doubt in the Buddha and Leiden, this, this, uh, this goes away uh, for the stream entrant. And then for the Sakatakami, both sense desire and the opposite which these are connected, aversion and ill will, they, they are 50% down at Sakatagami, at once returner. And they are completely eradicated at Anagami, never returner stage. That is 75% enlightenment. Then there's litaki and laziness and restlessness and regret. These are first uh, eliminated when you become an arahat because they can be very subtle, especially uh, if you come into a, uh, if you don't come into a special state that you want, for example, a higher state of meditative bliss, then there will be some restlessness. Uh, why, why is not happening? Why is not happening? So mind is, is cannot fall into complete peace because this state of wanting something is a higher form of desire. No lower sense desire. This desire for for a material rupa jhana, formless, not formful jhana, form jhana. Then there's uh, same also with laziness and lethargy. When you when you get the jhana, then you will have tenden tendency to uh, to fall into lethargy and laziness because it's a very quiet state. You can stay in the same state basically, not moving your body, not even breathing for seven days. So this induces 
a tendency to a very calm body and thereby also laziness. So these two notably first goes away for the Arahat into the com complete, but they also then can be, have, be fairly extraordinary. Uh, some of the Dutanka practices, for example, say that they, they, some of the monks, they haven't slept while lying down for 20 years in that order. So there's very little lazy they are, even when they are not enlightened. But still there is some laziness. But it's another kind of laziness that you normally see in normal society. First of all, while people who are intoxicated, or after they have been intoxicated, then usually they are very lazy. So these are the five hindrances. We take them again. This one sense desire, two ill will, three laziness, four restlessness and regret. Here, here under also worries. Five doubt and uncertainty. These are the five hindrances. They are not in particular connected with having a body, especially. In, apart from uh, sense desire. Some of the formless beings, they also have restlessness and regret. They also have uh, lethargy and laziness. But they, they cannot have doubt and uncertainty because they are higher than the stream entry level. So it's not connected. Some formless beings can also have mental hindrances, notably those I mentioned. So they do not, uh, they do not, uh, but since they have no body, this is not caught by the body. Why is it? What actually is is causing these uh, five mental hindrances? Again, since desire, karma, chanta, ill will, vipata, sloth and torta, chinamita, restlessness and regret, or worries, utak, utacha, kukucha, and skeptical doubt, vichikicha. There is some here. So, what is the cause? What do what do they arise from, and what do they seize from? What did the Buddha say about them? And then you can go to one of the first suttas in the Anguttara Nikaya. It's actually called the hindrances. It's one of the first suttas, few suttas I've translated myself on my website. I will also place a links, some links to the hindrances, which is a fairly uh, basic to know about, because you have to recognize in yourself, are any of these five hindrances in me now, or I, am I free from these five hindrances? So this I do regularly while brooming before sitting down for meditation, because if there is any of these five men mental hindrances present in the mind, then you cannot attain any absorption, any jhana. It's impossible. So this has to be kind of like broomed out of mind first. When you're broomed out the mental hindrances, clean your mind, not irreversibly, but they'll come back later, but just for the time being, then you can attain jhana. Where there is no, from the first jhana and upwards, there is no mental hindrances in the mind at that particular moment. That's why we call it them super mundane. They're not connected with the world. So what, if you take the first, what does it make sense to say, how does it arise? Yeah, the Buddha says, is irrational attention that you irrationally turn attention to the attractive features of objects it can be the attractive features uh, of a sexual object typically the genitals but also can be lips can be the hair or the face or the way a man or a woman speaks or the sound or anything a uh, food it can be its general appearance or the smell of it Whatever attractive features, whether it's a detail or it's a kind of like a wholeness of the object, turning attention to that makes sense desire goes away, goes up. It, it makes the sense of desire arise. So it's something that comes not from having a body, but from having contact with the object. Then what makes it goes away? It is rational attention to the disgusting features of the same object. That is to say, if there is, is, is a sex object, is another being, then one can focus, focus instead of focusing on the skin and on the bodily features, then one can focus on uh, the intestines or what there is in their bladder 
I want there is the vomit that is in their in their uh, in their stomach or the excrement that is in, in their in their bowels, for example. There are many other disgusting features about any object. So as soon as one turns one's attention to these disgusting, repulsive features, then sense desire goes away instantly. So thereby one defeats the mental hindrance of sense desire. This is important to know in a time where uh, obesity and the health problems connected with obesity, like type 2 diabetes, heart disease, stroke, uh, all kinds of muscular t- disease, a bone disease from having a, a huge obese body, high blood pressure also. These come from this not being able to say no to food. Then there's porn addiction. Uh, of the mental things you can say, there's addiction to all uh, intoxicants. There's addiction to internet, where we are looking here at now. The addiction to uh, gaming, uh, and which is also a mental state, the mental state of winning something, the, the joy of winning. This is uh, what drives the game, the game addiction. Huh? So these addictions are racing uh, entire industries and more or less running the world. So this is important to know that you don't, if you can defeat this addiction by turning the attention away from the attractive features of any object, of any desired object, to the repulsive features of the same object, then desire goes down, then you can control it. Otherwise you cannot control it. The mind just wants it, wants it, wants it, wants it, and keep pressing you until you go up because mind returns to these attractive features because it knows if it gets contact with these attractive features if it gets its junk then it will be satisfied and then it will find rest from scanning for pleasure for a moment short moment and then there will be a moment of peace and then there will be a moment of happiness and that's what mind wants so it's hunting this on whatever cost so there, of course, there's some sense desire. This is a fairly banal way of gaining happiness. And it has its side effects that is, you see from all kinds of addiction, from ob- obesity to a morphine addiction, to drinking, to whatever. So it's important to know. Then what ill will, what does uh, this arise? Yeah, this arises from, <laughs> from irrational attention to the repulsive feature. Here is not rational attention to the repulsive features. It's irrational attention to the repulsive features. So, for example, you notice a person is ugly, or a person is uh, disgusting, have a disgusting voice, or other kinds of appearance, or the food has it, or uh, the medicine has it, then you don't want to take the medicine, or the job has it, then you don't want to go to work, or whatever. So, even though the, the contact with the object is advantageous, kusala. If it has some kind of repulsive feature that pushes you away, then one cannot get to approach the object, even though it would be an advantage if one can approach the object. For example, having a vaccination is very advantageous. It can save your life, but it takes a moment of pain. That's repulsive. If you have to, just thinking about the needle entering the skin. <gasps> can be very fearful, and that's repulsive, the state of fear. So there, by some people say, I don't, I don't want to have any vaccinations. Then they get sick and die from, from whatever disease that could be prevented by vaccination. The same goes for, also for the cancer vaccines. So the irrational attention to the repulsive feature makes aversion arise. What makes aversion and ill will go away? It is uh, rational attention to infinite friendliness. This makes aversion goes away instantly. It, it evaporates right there, right there. Because you cannot be you cannot be aversive and angry towards 
this thing or that thing or that thing or that thing or that thing or this group of people or that this that kind of situation at the same time as you're having your mind focused on the object of infinite universal friendliness metta that's impossible so irrational attention to to the repulsive feature uh, of things not knowing that mind is seeing something it don't like makes aversion arise and it sees it sees when you go to universal friendliness so it's skillful substitution one takes an unskillful disadvantageous detrimental akusana mental state and substitute it with metta which is a skillful advantageous mental state which leads to nibbana what is uh, the laziness and lethargy uh, what does that make arise yeah, this is unnoticed and irrational attention to uh, being bored for example or laid back laxity or after meal drowsiness or the sluggishness of mind to so say ah now I've just eaten a meal now I need to sleep and then lie down and sleep Uh, even though you can see p- some people they sleep at uh, all kinds of uh, unusual places it can be very dangerous for them because of being robbed and so on but they never they, they say have to sleep after having eaten and so they, this is kind of an obsession where they're driven to their mind as soon as they, they see any kind of mental sluggishness or drowsiness after the meal or boredom then the mind then it cannot move It's kind of like stuck. We say this lethargy and laziness is like being in a prison because you cannot you cannot get out of it. You cannot get done what you need to to do. So it's really some something people also usually it can be connected, but not necessarily, but can be connected with intoxication because after having drinking uh, drunk alcohol, after having smoking marijuana. Or after having taken any other morphine-like drug or benzodiazepine the tranquilizer, you will feel sluggish and you will not be able to do anything. Maybe you feel relaxed. Yes, that's that's true. You feel relaxed, but that's basically because you're half anesthetized, uh, so you don't feel anything whatsoever. Uh, and that's very dangerous uh, because then you don't see what's coming up. A famous singer's daughter female famous singer that also died in a bathtub herself while lying face down her daughter also was recently found in a hotel in a bathtub uh, while being intoxicated and just today it was published with her cause of death was and she taken five different kinds of drugs she taken alcohol marijuana some uh, methamphetamine drug morphine uh, and some other drug also so they find five different different drugs in her bloodstream lying in her bathtub she was in her 20s so there she was overwhelmed by this lethargy and laziness while being in the bath in the bathtub very intoxicated So she kind of like fell asleep and drowned in a bathtub, which is very difficult because it's shallow water. You can get out of it any time, but not while you're heavily intoxicated. Anyway, anyway, you can also, if you not pay attention to this, even while being intoxicated, to this sloth and torpor, then you can get out of it and get uh, get alertness back on the road. What? Does it makes it go away? Yeah, there's uh, there's three factors. One notice directs attention rationally to the element of initiative, to the element of launching, to the element of endurance. So initiative is to say, ah, now I want to do the dishes. Get out the sofa and I want to do the dishes. That's something mental happening in the main mind only. Launching is when you get the legs out of the sofa. And actually get moving, get the body moving to do something. And endurance is when you have 
starting to do the dishes, did you complete the task? Completely. The ultimate perfection is just to say, ah, now I've done this task, and I've done it perfectly. It cannot be done better. Not only can I not do it better, but, but it cannot be done better. Then you have finished it in a way that is perfect. That's the ultimate task of endurance. So, again, sloth and torpor, it arises because of irrational attention to either boredom, after meal, sluggishness, or sloth, sluggishness of the mind. The mind is kind of like slow. It's irrational attention to that. It makes this sloth and torpor, tinamitta, arise. While rational attention to one, the element of initiative, two, the element of launching, three, the element of endurance, is what makes tinamitta goes away. This was the fourth hindrance. Uh, sorry, the third hindrance, the five, uh, fourth hindrance was restlessness and regret. Utacha kukucha. What does set uh, makes arise? Yes, this is uh, is this uh, irrational attention. You can also call it stress. That will be the normal expression. It's irrational attention to this mental unrest. Usually when you recognize you're stressed, then you just say, ah, I'm stressed. I'm so stressed that I cannot do anything. So my uh, to-do list, which has 177 numbers, I cannot do anything today. No, no, because I'm too stressed. I'm too, too stressed. Here, one doesn't recognize that the mind is agitated. So one cannot come out of the, uh, the unrest. It's irrational attention to this unnoticed. Huh? So one doesn't see that it, it is mind that is unrest. How do, so how does it this cease? Yeah, while stop, one stops up, so say, okay, what's, how to make it go away, this restlessness? Then one pay, pay attention to two, it's again substitution of the mental state. First one, recognize, ah, there's restlessness and regret in my mind. I'm stressed. <gasps> then one says, go back to the book, because one has it in one's mind, because one has been told by the monk, and one has seen it in text innumerable times. By repetition, one has practiced this many times before. One routinely then say, ah, that's tranquility of the body, and that's tranquility of the mind. This, for example, ticks with the legs or, or the hair or it's the ear or, or all these kinds of ticks or kind of like drumming. This is restlessness of the body. The opposite of that is a, is a calm body. This is just tranquility of the body. There's, there's unrest of the body while you're running a marathon, for example. But after the man has come home from his marathon, taken a bath, and have a drunken uh, two liter of juice, and lie under a tree in his own garden, then there is rest, tranquility of the body. The unrest of the mind can for, be, for example, after you played a computer game, one of these shooting games. <laughs> you have to be very quick, otherwise you get you get uh, zapped from behind. Usually by one of your friends, uh, or whatever. Can also be uh, you're worried about your economy, you're worried about your private life, or, about, or uh, regarding your children, or regarding future states of disease, or whatever that's kind of like worries. This nagging mind is going in circles, and it's going, the circles become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Therefore, it repeats the same mental state again and again with a quicker and quicker frequency, this unrest of the mind. Again, one breaks it by noticing just these two, that there's tranquility of the body, there's tranquility of the mind. 
because then one has to just by focusing on this tranquility one has to discriminate what is tranquility of the body and what is tranquility of the mind and this is not enough to break this <gasps> stress cycle which is repeating itself so the unnoticed restless state of the mind irrational attention to that is making restlessness and regret arise rational attention to tranquility of the body and tranquility of the mind makes restlessness and regret cease what about uh, Ill will we have talk about launching tranquility, uh, ah, doubt and uncertainty. What does uh, doubt and uncertainty, what is it basically? It's a state of ignorance. Uh, it's a state that, 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 that you don't know. And this is basically because uh, one is confused by irrational attention. One, what do I mean by irrational attention? Irrational attention, samyoyana, is something that goes to the womb of things, that goes to cause and effect. Say, ah, there's a state, what's the cause of it? There's a state, what's the effect of it? So, cause and effect is the basics of Buddhism. If you can take the cause away, then if it's a problem, then the problem also disappears. If you can provo pr provide a cause, then the effect also comes. If it's some advantageous state that you want, then you provide the cause. You don't long for the state itself. You just say, ah, what's the cause? Ah, I have to de deliver this cause. You deliver the cause, you get the effect. So cause and effect, because of, of dependent co-arising, if you have one, if you have one, you get the other one. Either they arise one out of the other, or they arise together and cease together. So one state is depending upon the other state. Or more than one state, but it's just that these, these things are connected. They are not independent. If this arise, that also arise. If this cease, that also cease. So, if this arise, if it's detrimental, if something bad, then you have to say, ah, why, what was the link before? What was the cause of it? And if you need this to arise, if it's advantageous, you also have to say, ah, what's the cause of it? And you have to deliver this cause. So it's this lacking of this rational attention to cause and effect. That's what made doubt and uncertainty arise. While, of course, rational attention to this particular cause and effect dependency, this makes uh, doubt and uncertainty go away. So, uh, I think uh, this more or less covers the five hindrances on a, on a basic level. So we can go to question two. Can formless beings, the five last level of the 31 levels of, experience, of, of existence, where we are on level five, and this is the five highest levels, they have no body, they have only mind, they are only conscious. They are dispersed over enormous areas of space. Uh, more than one galaxy. They stay in a very peaceful uh, state of mind, uh, focusing on only one thing uh, out of five, and that is the infinitude of space, the infinitude of consciousness, nothingness, neither perception nor non perception, neurota, cessation of perception. And So they stay there in the ultimate sense 
they have a, uh, the highest of them have a life length of 84,000 universal cycles. 84,000 times 6,200 billion years. Their subjective time goes much, much, much slower than ours. So let's say a period, I cannot remember the exact math, but a period of 10,000 years would be like one day for us, uh, approximately. Uh, it's less than that, it's less than that, because we have 35,000 days, if we say uh, a normal life length, and they see 84,000 universes. So it's a probably one day is corresponds to one universal cycle, one eon, one kalba. That is pro in the order of 6,200 uh, billion years. So their subjective time goes extremely, extremely slow in, in our time frame. But they experience it uh, in their time frame. So the subjective time is completely elastic, completely elastic. A B or an end uh, experience a subjective time much more acute than we do. And we also can ex change our subjective experience of time. If you jumped out from, from a, a, high, a high place into water, for example, you will experience time very acute, a second as, let's say, maybe seven seconds or 10 seconds. So it's a 10 factor of time dilation. While you are, if you are, for example, sleeping or having an absent-mindedness, then, then that can pass 10, let me say, an hour. And you will, if you ask after it how much has passed, you say, ah, six, seven minutes. So there's again a, a ten factor a difference in your subjective time experience. So it's completely elastic, completely elastic. So the idea of absolute time is doesn't make sense, uh, neither subjectively nor relativistically. Can formless beings experience desire without contact as a requisite? Uh, no, because. When they form, when these uh, these formless beings experience desire, then they experience desire to having another higher mental state. That if if they are focused, have been focused, uh, they can only go upwards. If they are focused, for example, one life on uh, the infinity of space, then in the in, uh, approaching the end of that life, they may say, Ah, uh, what if you I focused on the infinity of consciousness? That would be more subtle. Then they experience desire for that mental state, but that's also sense desire. It's a six kinds, six kinds of this, sixth kind of desire, desire after a particular mental state. In this kind, exceedingly subtle, exceedingly high, but in principle the same as a drug addicted person or the alcoholic has for a certain mental state, or the meditator has for a lower mental state than that than that high arupajana, formless attainment, formless absorption. So can formless beings uh, experience desire without contact as no, categorical no. Then we go uh, with some qu over to some, this, this was enough with the, f the five mental hindrances, the nivaranas. Ne then we go to uh, some questions about the, uh, a lot of questions actually about the stream intent. And we just, I just repeat again, what a Sudhapana is. He's a stream winner or a stream entrant, a one who has one stream entry. Uh, he's one, uh, he's the lowest, he's 25% enlightened. And he's he's one of the noble persons, Arya Pukkala. And three kinds are to be distinguished. There's uh, one who has seven lives to go. Then there's one who Satakatakatu Parama. It's called then the one who's passing from non noble family to another noble family. I, he's called a Kulankula. And then there were ones germinating only once more. And Ikebichi, yes. Only two lives left. So there's three different stages. So what is it that uh, this man uh, is his defined as? He's a f if a man, after the disappearance of the three fetters, the Samyoyanas, which is personality belief, this is my body, I am my body, this is my feeling, 
this is my perception, this is my mental construction, my initiative, and this is my consciousness. Or this is me. This is basically personality, belief. Skeptical doubt, which you you, and then attachment to rule and ritual. These three he has eliminated. Then he has entered the stream to Nibbana. He is no more subject to rebirth in the lower worlds. He cannot be an animal. He cannot be a ghost, hungry ghost. He cannot be an angry demon, an asura. He cannot be. Uh, he cannot be a hell being. So he cannot fall down to the fearful state, apaya. He cannot fall down. He cannot experience downfall. And that's why it is so important, crucial for all Buddhists to reach this state in this life, because otherwise. Nothing is for sure. Nothing is for sure. You go one life, you can forget all about Buddhism, then you start killing, you start stealing, you buy this, blah, 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 because of circumstances, pressure, uh, circumstances on the earth will change. They are in the moment of deterioration, so one will have a social pressure to do evil things, and then they experience, as a consequence thereof, downfall. So one has to pass this limit in this life, because otherwise, Nothing is certain. Nothing is sure. Nothing is sure. There's no guarantees. However, for the stream entrant, because it's an irreversible, irreversible state, he can say for sure that he or she will never be an animal again, will never be a hungry ghost again, will never be a demon again, angry demon again, will never be a hell being again. And since these states are so inexpressible, painful, from fear to screaming pain. It is important to get rid of this danger, to get the, the holes in existence closed, so you can walk without fear. It's crucial, really crucial. I'll read out some text about how to do it later on. But first, the characterization of the state. He has no more subject to rebirth in lower worlds, is firmly established and destined to full enlightenment. He is sure that he or she will be enlightened. Sure, certain, within seven lives at most. Completely sure. And that's why it's entered the stream. The other one is just, if you're not noble, then you are samsara, it's just it's a circle, you're going around in a circle. On a high state or usually on a lower state, but anyway, it's going around in a circle. Then nothing is sure. Where you will, which circle you will be on a lower state down here, on a higher state there, or in between, that's a go. It's according to the karma, according to the karmic accumulation. All intentional actions one has done in their past. But after having passed this moment of streaming, Sutapati Maka this path moment, then one is irreversibly changed. So then one will never, 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 ever again fall down. After having passed amongst the heavenly and human beings only seven times more through the rounds of samsara, he puts an end to suffering. Such a man is called a seven births at most, satakarato parama seven births at most, maximum. If, it may, if a man, after the disappearance of the three fetters, is destined to full enlightenment, he, after having passed among noble families two or three times through the round of rebirths, puts an end to suffering. Such a man or human being is called one passing from one noble family to another, and call Angola. If a human being, after the disappearance of the three fetters, which again is personality belief, Sakaya Ditti, skeptical doubt, which you get in the Buddhist enlightenment, in the reality of the fact of the Buddhist enlightenment. And three, attachment to rule. And which Silvata Paramasa, that some funny hats or incense sticks or rules and various rituals can make you pure and can contain any efficacy regarding your future. Believing in that, this attachment clinging to a particular rule and ritual. Usually, a culture of culture nature, some some kind of culture. If 
a human being after the disappearance of the three first is destined for full enlightenment. He, after having passed only once more, returned to human existence, puts an end to suffering. Such a human being is called one germinating only once more. Ikabiji. There's a whole Sutta Pati uh, chapter in the Samyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses of the Buddha, called Sutta Pati Samyutta. There you re- go on there, get this book, go there and read everything about what the Buddha he said about this. Because this is, he's an enlightened being, perfectly self-enlightened, Samasambhuri being. So he's gone through all these stages, he you know by direct experience. So it's good to read that. I give only kind of like a summary of what he has said. How long time, so this was uh, Sotabana, just say in, in brief. Uh, uh, maybe we should go and say uh, just a little bit more. What what does it, uh, What there's two times four, there's the four helpers and the four steps. It's uh, Sotabati Yanga and Sotabati Anga. Don't confuse. What is the f- four helpers? Here, a householder, uh, the noble disciple, he possesses confirmed confidence and conviction conviction in the Buddha in exactly this way, worthy, honorable, and perfectly self-enlightened, is the Buddha, consummated in knowledge and behavior, all transcended, expert in all dimensions, knower of all worlds, unsurpassable trainer of those who can be tamed, teacher and guide of both gods and humans, blessed, exalted, awakened and enlightened is the Buddha. He possesses confirmed confidence in the Dhamma exactly in this way. Perfectly formulated is this Buddha Dhamma, visible right here and now, immediately effective, timeless, inviting each and every one to come and see for themselves inspect, examine, and verify, leading each and every one through progress towards perfection, directly observable, experienceable, and realizable by each intelligence. He also possesses confirmed confidence in the Noble Sangha in this way. Perfectly tra- training is this Noble Sangha community of the Buddhist Noble Disciples, deserving both gifts, self-sacrifice, offerings, hospitality, and reverence and salutation with joint palms. Since this Noble Sangha community the Buddhist noble disciples is an unsurpassable and forever unsurpassed field of merit, punya, in this world, for this world to honor, protect, respect, and and support. And the last point, this was face in the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and the three jewels. The last point, important, he possesses a pure morality, sila, esteemed by the noble ones, like this way. It is unbroken, untorn, unspotted, unmodeled, freeing, praised by the wise, natural, leading to mental concentration, to absorption. These are the four factors of street entry that a noble disciple possesses. Again, confirmed conviction in the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. Pure, unspotted morality as number four. Then there's four more. Help us. This was the four steps, Sutapanasa and Gani, the faith and the morality as the fourth. Then there's a four, four Sutapati Yanga, help us to stream into. This is a companionship with great men, friendship with great men, hearing the true Dhamma, wise reflection on cause and effect on this Dhamma, and living in accordance with this Dhamma. This is the four helpers to stream entry. Then we come to the questions. The questions are actually, actually about when you have entered the stream, then the first moment, the, the entry moment is one moment when there's an irreversible phase transition of consciousness where mind goes 25% enlightenment up. To, before that, there was a gradual approach, gradual approach where one comes kind of like higher, 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 higher from this side, yeah, higher, 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 and then suddenly, whoop, it goes 25% up. This happens in one moment. Immediately after that, this is the Sutta Bhati Makkha. One experiences the Sutta Bhati Phala, the fruit. 
of the state. This fruit one experiences many times after. It has nothing to do, the question is, is how long time can there be between Sudapadimakka and Sudapadafala fruit? Uh, the, it, it, it always, if there is Sudapati Maka, it is always followed by fruit falla immediately after, at least one moment. But one moment can be very short, it's, let's say, a hundredth of a second or a billionth of a second, but there has to be one moment. Then, uh, according to what the, 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 the mental defilements of this being and the karma also, this being might or might not experience this fruit again for a long time. Or they might experience it for, for, for when they attain it, then uh, we call it falla uh, samapati, that they attain to the fruit of nobility. This goes for all the four, this four stages. The stream entrant, he has a maka moment, only one, and then he attains, after this state, he attains many falla moments. So also for the once returner, the never returner, and the other. So, it happens ma many times after. The fruit comes many times after, immediately after the moment where one attains, which is only one moment, where one is stunned by it, and where one's object is Nibbana. The fruit, what is the fruit? Uh, there's many questions about this. Uh, how long time can there be between Sotapati Makka, path moment, and Sotapati Fala, the fruit moment? There can be, uh, there is only one moment in in the initial case, but then in the after ones, there can, one can spend years, uh, and I would guess also even lives, without having any fruit. But usually one will experience fruit regular, on a regular basis, with increasing frequency, while uh, approaching the next state of how can a person do, what can a person do to shorten this uh, gap? Yeah, this is the same as, it's, it's a comically con uh, conditioned event, the fruit, as, as any other mental state. So any kind of uh, practice that increase the merit and increase the insight uh, and increase the calm with, will increase this, uh, these fruit moments coming. It, the fruit, is a joy, is a gladness that is not of this world. It's a joy not of this world. It is a joy and peace, a satisfaction, connected with Nibbana. It can also be connected with the opposite, kind of like saying, <laughs> you're looking back at your prior state, for example, when you were smoking, or when you were running around in circles, like most beings are in the world. After this object or that object, they running around in circles after sex or after money or after sex and money and drugs and rock and roll and you name it after sense pleasure basically so they are running around running around running around but they're never satisfied and the more they get the more they want and seeing this having kind of like escaped this hamster wheel this rat race after pleasure one experience of joy this joy is not connected with the world and it's not kind of like you are saying they are less than you. It's not arrogant in any way. It's, uh, you have great sympathy and empathy and pity towards these beings still running around in these samsaric circles. They are running around in the last 10 years, the last 10 lives, the last 10 universes, the last 10,000 universes, and still they are running around. And it's difficult to say when they will break out. They have to see the noble truth, the four noble truths to break out. But when it will happen, it can be very difficult to say. But it's looking back at this, having escaped this extreme amount of dukkha, of suffering, connected with this running around in circles after sense pleasure. It's seeing that, that this fruit can come. And as I say, it's a joy, a satisfaction, a very peaceful, but it can also have elements of fun. Laughing at yourself is a... Uh, very common, laughing at the world, uh, seeing how futile uh, all these projects in the world are. If you want a house, or you want this or that, you plan this or that, this and that, but why? basically it's the, the entire world is suffering. So whatever planning is going on, except attaining Nibbana, that's a futile project. 
because it will only end up in suffering anyway, always. Why? Because of impermanence. So it is having escaped this addiction, this ring in the nose, that one was invisible ring in the nose, and running uh, uh, while the ring is bound to a pole in the middle, and one is running around this pole of sense pleasure usually. It's having escaped that one feels a joy that is not of this world, that is connected with Nibbana. It would have not said much about it, and there's uh, not many stories about it. And that's because it is individual. It's not something that you can say uh, how to experience. I can only kind of like outcast the, the, the frames of it and give some few examples of it. It's like a, it can be compared to a smoker that have stopped smoking looking back while he was addicted to smoking, how, how terrible it was. Or like a fat person that has learned to control his... Or, her food intake and look back and uh, now she don't feel disgusted by looking down her own body because she's she's escaped this addiction that was connected with with food. Any kind of addiction can also be addiction to money, a banker that has gone uh, or an investor that has been completely addicted to this earning big size money shortly uh, and then uh, blowing them again uh, on some other project. Escaping that can also be. Escaping running after a, an academic career. Uh, escaping the, uh, the conventional pressure for having a family and having a job and being normal. Normal. Which is a very fearful state in my opinion. Very fearful. This is having escaped that this automate, which is basically irrational, which is futile, which is a, a, an invisible prison running around in circles in samsara, repeating, ever repeating, aging, sickness, and death. Being born again, aging, sickness, and death. Being born again. And every time there's aging, there's, uh, one should hear these, all these complaints from these aging beings because they don't see why what have brought them there. Ah, he was sin's desire. But also ill will, skeptical doubt. Sloth and torpor, and so on. Basically, mental defilements, and not something out there in the world. Why is there a time gap between Magga and Fala? Why do some gain Fala and fruit at the same time? Why is there a time gap? Because Magga has, the mind has to do, make this phase transition first, and then it can proceed to the fruit. The stream entrance is not in the fruit all the time. If somebody knocks his head, then he doesn't have this Nibbanic uh, peace and joy and gladness and very, <laughs> very radical uh, gladness, joy, which is difficult to understand for other people. They, they, uh, Non-noble people doesn't understand why nobles they laugh. But nobles al always understand why the other nobles laugh and why they smile. So it goes against the stream. It's not something that you can grasp, but you can experience your for yourself, and that's what one should do. What exactly is this fruit? Is it a state of jhanic bliss, or is something different like nibbana peace? It has nothing in particular to do with jhana, but it can be connected with jhana. That's can be, you can also, it's also a super mundane state, super mundane, not of this world. So, w the bliss you experience while in jhana is also a joy, not of this world. But a, a person not doing any meditation can still have experienced fruit moments. Uh, while, uh, and that's also a question is it lying down or is it while meditation or standing, and how, how long time does it last? Uh, I see any stories in Tibet is describing a person attaining uh, the fruit after attaining Magga. There's not many stories about it actually, and this is because it's so individual. It's not something that you can uh, share much about, because whatever if you share something about, like I'm trying now actually, uh, one doesn't get the taste of it really. It's something that can be experienced. So here you have to take the blue pill. 
in, like in morphos. You have to experience it yourself. Otherwise, you can never get any funny ideas about what it is. So one has to experience it oneself and go for it. And the way to go for it is these four helpers and the four steps I just mentioned. Basically, the fruit is a joy, gladness, satisfaction uh, that is not of this world. It's not connected to this world. And nobody is not interested in this world. Why? Why not, actually? Because he knows it to be suffering. Only suffering. On the, in the ultimate sense. So he's interested in something else. He's interested in freedom. He's interested in deathlessness. He's interested in the highest bliss, Nibbana, which is one and the same thing. Not three things, but one thing. One unity. One oneness. Since this is the highest of any form of being in existence, then this is his primary or her primary interest. And experiencing just the smell of it, the shadows of it, or getting a handle of what they are, is enough to say no to this whole circus of sense pleasure, which is banal, vulgar, low. Detrimental, disciplined teachers, usually leading to side effects that are uncontrollable, usually leading to suffering. And in all cases, if sense desire is, is still there at the moment of death, then it leads to rebirth, to a state where you can sense something, because that's basically what mind wants, it wants to sense something. So that's what it gets. It gets a body with the ability to sense with the six senses. When it gets a body, it also gets aging. When it gets aging, it also gets sickness. When it gets sickness, it also gets death. Death is suffering. It's not happiness. So that's the problem. Uh, I hope I have said enough about this fruit. It's a joy of none of this world. It comes immediately after the manga moment. And it repeats many and many times, but it's not always present and can be repeated, repeat itself from various objects and in various forms for many times for any noble and does so uh, over multiple times during their life. And they will all have difficulties with sharing it because the non noble doesn't dig it, they don't get it. Uh, how much ever you try. But I have tried. <laughs> <laughs> a little. I hope you get it. Anyway, I hope you get something at least. Question eight is the last uh, thing. Have you ever met a person or a monk who has attained some magic of penis? Did you ever witness superhuman powers? Can you share with us some interesting stories? Please, Bant. Yes. Unfortunately, uh, there's a rule that doesn't allow monks to tell about their own uh, or other people's attainment of these superhuman states, including jhana, including nobility, including apinas, the magical powers. It's not allowed, because somebody start to boast about it, not about themselves at the Buddhist time, but they said about their colleagues that had this net in order to their colleagues could get more food. Then their colleagues got more food, then they boasted about the one who boasted about them, and then he also got more food. Then they come back to the Buddha three months after, the rain retreats, it was famine in the entire India, and then he saw that it was kind of like, uh, not fat, but they have eaten plenty of these lay people that were, uh, were, were starving themselves, and then the Buddha laid down the rule, no way, you cannot tell anything about it today, people. You can share it with other ordained people, novices and monks and nuns, but not lay people, because of this starvation issue. And because some of uh, it, they, they, they wanted to get food on account of these magical powers. It is something also for myself, I can say, that was uh, driving my my desire to become a monk at to to <laughs> to to enter the noble way. Actually, actually these superpowers, huh? elevation, for example, you want to fly like a bird, mm -hmm. ah, Superman, or dive into the earth, 
or swim uh, in free air or whatever. Know other people's minds and so on. Have the divine eye, deeper jago. But uh, the Buddha himself, and at this I also have come to understood, these are not in any means by themselves. They can be practical, yes, to, for transportation from one place to another. If you can fly by your own force, then of course it's easy for transportation. But even if you can fly uh, by the force of the mind, you still have to die. So suffering is not ended. That's an important point. So Buddha, he said, this, these are penis, these super noble powers. They are disgusting, he said. Disgusting. They are not the greatest miracle there is. The greatest miracle there is, is that verbal instruction is possible. You can instruct people to approach Nibbana, even though Nibbana itself cannot be expressed, cannot be explained in any possible way, because language is developed to explain something in the world, but it doesn't say anything about something that is not of this world, not inside the universe, that is not included in time and space, has no temporal aspects, has no spatial aspects. So that he said, this is the greatest miracle. Not these trivial, banal, vulgar superpowers that more or less is driving this. This One should see that this is kind of like an immaturity. It's like the Superman dream or the Superwoman dream. Huh? The small boy who likes to be Superman, a Superman or Batman or something like that. Or Superwoman, huh? the small girl who likes to be Superwoman or super pretty. Same thing. It's, an, it's a kind of like an adornment of the ego. It's a kind of ego gratification. One wants to gratify this ego with superhuman powers or be particularly good and also desire to be praised for these superhuman powers, uh, powers and being famous for these superhuman powers. This also desire for that. And there, if you go for that, then... <laughs> You go down a blind road because you, if you, one attains these superhuman powers, one can also make a terrible many mistakes about it. One example is that story I can't say tell because the man is dead now. Devadatta, the evil cousin of the Buddha, he wants to, he asks the Buddha whether he could take over the Sangha and become boss of the Sangha. Then the Buddha says, ah, How can you say such a thing? He was in the company of, of kings and so on. Nobility. How can you say such a thing? That one like you cannot ever lead the Sangha. Then he dismissed him. Then ill will, ill will, raised in Devadatta to, to kind of like say, split the Sangha and make his own Sangha. For that he needs support from a king. How do you get support from a king? You could show him, show off some superpowers. Then he manifested in this king's lap while the king was sing, s sitting in his throne, he manifested himself because he had superhuman powers. He, he was an expert in meditation at that, at that point of view. But uh, immediately after, he lost the, the superhuman powers. But this one trick he could do before he lost them. He lost them when he, he formed the intention later, a little later that he would set a split in the Sangha. Right there, uh, Devas, they saw that he lost his superhuman powers right there, and they reported it to the Buddha, but the Buddha knew already your superhuman power. You cannot uh, have, form an intention to split the Sangha and then retain superhuman powers. It's impossible. But nevertheless, before that, he uh, manifested himself as a lot of baby snakes in the lap of a young king, a young prince, Bimbisara's son. And, uh, and this, of course, this prince, he, he became, suddenly there was a lot of baby snakes in his lap. He became very agitated. And then Devadatta manifested himself uh, a, a little distance away from him as Devadatta in Devadatta's body. Then this young prince was very impressed with him. Then, because he was very impressed with him, he followed him through uh, on all his plans. Amongst those, to kill his own father, King Bimbisara, which he did. So they both ended up in hell because of being impressed with Devadatta's superhuman powers to manifest as a bunch of baby snakes in a young prince's lap. So you see, very dangerous indeed. It does not entail escape from suffering. 
that's that's one story. What's one story I can tell though is a lay person, a former monk, that was once my teacher. He showed me very gently, and little by little, because I had skeptical doubt about it in 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 the first place. I had to have it confirmed uh, repeatedly three or four times, and uh, scrutinized him about it, make some tests, independent tests, whether he could read my mind or not, and he could, and he proved it to me that he could read. It was never something we discussed openly. But I put my test on him. And he knew I put my test on him, of course. So uh, he just disclosed it uh, very gently. And this is uh, uh, something I can say that this was uh, without doubt the case, that he could read my mind. The, the, famous, uh, uh, <laughs> the famous author of the other commentaries, Buddha Gosa, which lived in Bodh Gaya at that time. He has a teacher who was, or could also read his mind. And Buddha Gosa, he was an expert uh, in this text, in the Tipitaka. Then one day he was sitting meditating in his cabin. And then say, who knows most about this text, what the Buddha said, the Tipitaka, me or my teacher. And then, of puffed up pride, he said, ah, I know much more than him, of course. And then uh, the teacher, some hundred meters away, he read his mind. I say, now my pupil has got this pride. And he makes this wrong view that he knows more than me. He knows more on the theoretical level, but on the practical level. Payaki and the penetration level, Padiveta level, he, he knows much less. So he took on his sandal, this old man, walked down to the pupil's uh, cabin, knocked the door, clunk, 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 clunk. And then uh, the pupil, Buddha goes, he opened the door and says, ah, uh, friend, can it be that you just thought, just Two minutes ago that you thought, uh, who knows more about this text? Uh, me or my teacher? And then you concluded that you yourself actually knew more about the text than me. Is that correct? <laughs> you can imagine Buddha goes, huh? he was of course very meek and humiliated by the fact that he suddenly understood that the teacher was able to read his mind from two hundred from a distance of two hundred meters. But he was not able to read his teacher's mind, uh, even up close. Uh, so he fell down on his feet and asked for forgiveness from his teacher. And the teacher sent a very intelligent guy. He said, OK, Burgas, but on one condition, I will forgive you. The text is here. Tipitaka is here, but the commentaries have been lost. You go to Sri Lanka, and they still have the commentaries intact there. You translate, back translate there the commentaries from Sinhalese language to Pali. Then when you come back here to Bodhka, then I will forgive you. And this be <laughs> because Buragosa, he was a great uh, theoretician and a great linguistic also. So he went down there and did the job in some uh, decade or two and went back and got his forgiveness from his teacher, which of course had, level, had attained another level uh, than him. So this is just a story. A story about uh, first pride, puffed up pride, again ego gratification. I am better, and then the humility uh, of being unpuffed, bloop, like a balloon bursting, and then the cure, going to Sri Lanka here, writing down all the commentaries, taking them back to India. Good job. More than a decade it took. Tremendous job. That's why we still know the meaning of the text. I hope this answers all the question. It's now one hour, eight minutes, and 54 seconds. So I think this is enough for today. Ah, maybe I should just say a little bit about what is these superhuman powers uh, in the first place. The Apina. You, we can also say it's called direct knowledge. So it's not something like direct experience in the meaning of direct experience. You, you directly experience that you can elevate yourself up into the air. I read aloud the definition. The six higher powers or supernormal normalities consist of five mundane lokia powers. They're not super mundane. Attainable through the utmost perfection 
in mental concentration, samadhi. And one super mundane, lokutala power, attainable through penetrating inside, vipassana. Namely, the extension of all the fermentation, asavakaya, destruction of the mental fermentation. In other words, realization of aratship or holiness. That's the only lokutala, super mundane, out of this world, attainment of a direct knowledge, of an apina, of a supernormal power that's becoming our earth. They are magical powers to divine ear, magical powers, itivita, divine ear, diva sutta, penetration of minds by others, reading others' minds, jetto pariyana nana, remembrances of former existences, pupa nivasa anusati, you remember all your past lives, divine eye, dipa chakku, can see what is very far away in another galaxy. Extension of all the fermentation. Asavakaya. The stereotype text made with in all four Sutra collections is as follows. Now, because the monk enjoys the various magical powers, it divita, such as be, be, being one, he becomes many. Instead of being one, he, he can become like an army. Having become many, having been an army, he becomes one again. He appears, he disappears. Without being abducted, he passes through walls, or he passes through mountains, just as if through the open air. In the earth, he dives and rises up again. He can swim in the earth, just as if in water. He walks on water without sinking, just like Jesus, just as if on earth. cross leg, he flies through the air, just like a winged bird. With his hand, he touches the sun and the moon, these so mighty ones, so powerful ones, we can touch from earth the, the sun and the moon. Even up to the Brahma world, he has mastery over this body, over the material form. With the divine ear, he hears sounds, both heavenly and human, far and near. Both divine, the devas, the sounds, the devas make noise and conversations he can hear. Uh, and I also can hear any human conversation far away, let's say uh, 1,000 kilometers. He knows the minds of other beings, of other persons, by penetrating, penetrating them with his own mind. He knows the greedy mind as a greedy mind, and a not greedy mind as a not greedy mind. He knows the hating mind as a hating, and the not hating as a not hating. He knows the diluted mind as a diluted mind, and a not diluted mind as a not diluted mind. He knows the shrunken mind as a shrunken mind and a distracted mind as a distracted mind, and a developed mind as a developed mind. The surpassable mind as a surpassable mind, and an unsurpassable mind as an unsurpassable mind. The concentrated mind as a concentrated mind, and the unconcentrated one as one who has no concentration. The freed mind and the unfreed mind, he knows. By penetrating others' mind with his own mind, he envelopes others' mind with his own mind. He remembers many former existences, such as one birth, two, three, four, five, hundred thousand birth, remembers many constructs and dissolutions of the worlds, many universes. There was a such a such a species, such a such a name, and such a such a life I had. I ate this and that, I was like this and that, the joys I had was this and that, I lived in this and that house, or in this and that cave, or under earth, or in the water, I swam around like a fish, like this and that. And vanishing from there, I entered into existence somewhere else. And vanishing from, from there, I later reappeared here. Thus he remembers, always together with the marks and all peculiarities, many former existences, many former lives. With the divine eye, Dipachakku, the pure one, he sees beings vanishing and reappearing, low and noble ones, beautiful and ugly ones. He sees how beings are reappearing and according, according to their karma. These beings, indeed, follow evil ways in bodily actions, words, and thoughts, insulted the noble ones, held evil views, wrong views, and according to these wrong views, they acted and performed evil, karma, wrong behavior. At the dissolution of their body, right after death, they appeared in a lower world, in a painful state of existence, in the world of suffering, even in hell. But those other beings, however, who are in doubt with good action, based on right, you have reappeared in a happy existence in a divine world. So it's no something is the deeper chakra is an ability to see 
when people die, all beings die, we know so animals die, where do they reappear right after? Where do they reappear? They can see. And because they also can see their past life, then they can say, ah, this one, he did this and that, and now he has reappeared here and here. So they can form the connection, the causal connection between the coming declaration here and the rebirth, rebirth destination here. So it's from seeing that directly, they have direct experience, direct handle on it. They can say that. Through the existence, or extinction, or uh, destruction of all the fermentations, Asavakaya, even in this life, he enters into the position of the release of mind, the release through understanding, after having himself understood and realized it. So, uh, except for the last one, this has nothing to do with nobility. These are mundane states, except for ending the mental fermentations, mundane states. These were the apinas, the direct knowledges, of which uh, some of them are the idivita, or the magical junk. Thank you for your attention. Namo. Tasso. <laughs> Bhagavato. Arato. Sama. Sambudasa. Sapasata. Bhavantu. Sukitata. May all be. All sentient beings, may all these beings become happy from this information. Maybe even so. Have a nice day. <laughs>